So this is posterior vitreous dashing, which is super important. It's like uh, not half my day, but probably um, three people a day are posterior vitreous detachment. So you need to know this. Um, a posterior vitreous detachment is usually about age 50 to 70 when it's supposed to happen. The ring on the back of the vitreous is one of the few things I know. They got two people's names. I'm not sure how. A Weiss ring or a vote ring. Tears occur in 2% of eyes with a PVD. Your book says 20%, and a lot of people say 15%. Um, and it, if you have acute floaters in someone over 50, it's almost always from a PVD. So, so about that, what I gen, we get in my practice, I don't know what you do in your clinic, but in my practice, every almost everybody gets an OCT on the way into see because there's so much macular disease and there's so much weird stuff that we, you wouldn't see without an OCT. If you have an OCT on the patient, look at it, you can tell if they have a PVD because you can't miss it. You know, it's impossible to miss a PVD on an OCT scan. So I always look at the, and sometimes you'll have someone come in with all the signs and symptoms of PVD and there's no PVD on the OCT scan and then it's like a whole other discussion. So that's the first thing. The other thing is I think the reason that tears is so variable is because symptomatic tractional tears I think occur in about 2%. And I've looked at, because we I did a paper with one of the residents, I'll show you later, years ago. And we looked at all the literature for that paper. And I think the reason the number is so wide is because people put in the asymptomatic breaks, which are super common. Like 10% of people have retinal holes somewhere. Um, so because so many people are lattice degeneration is 8% of the population. So if you take all your lattice degeneration removal holes and all your people with asymptomatic holes, you get 15 or 20%. But a real tear, like a fresh tear with a PVD is probably about 2% of people. Um, if you see pigment in the vitreous in a phacic patient, they have a tear. So the first thing I do on a PVD patient is I look at their anterior vitreous. When you look at the anterior vitreous, have them look straight, have them look up and down, and straight again, and watch it go around. It's called the dynamic vitreous. And that's the way you'll see the pigment. And if you see pigment or blood, good. I'm sorry, can you get Schaefer sign from any other cause? Not pigment. Well, if you're pseudophagic, you can have pigment in your anterior vitreous because of your cataract surgery might have been a little traumatic. Um, you can have cells in the anterior vitreous from a bunch of stuff. I guess you could have a melanoma sloughing cells, if you look like. But I've not seen it. It, it. It's it's if you have a PVD, if you can see, and you'll get better. I remember my when I was in training, the uveitis specialists who would look at the anterior chamber and try to say they saw mostly lymphocytes or mostly macrophages. You know, which I don't know. But but you do after you've looked at enough inflamed eyes. Sometimes the cells are kind of small, and sometimes they're kind of bigger. So when you look at the anterior vitreous, and the other thing is that with your anterior vitreous, sometimes you'll see kind of old cells or new cells, but when you see pigment, it's pretty striking. So pigment means there's a tear. And then this shows just the vitreous falling down. I wish I had some better stuff to show patients to explain the vitreous and how the traction behind the tear can cause the detachment. So this was the paper, Matt. He was, this was, well, how many years is this? 10 years ago, I guess? Um, yeah, 2013 we published it, but we probably submitted it because it's published in Retina. They take five years to publish papers about. Uh, we probably submitted it in 2008. Uh, probably, probably not, probably 2011. But he pulled all, we pulled all the charts with uh, hemorrhagic, with PVD. And he looked for, um, um, actually with hemorrhagic PVD. So these were, this is the biggest series of hemorrhagic PVD and retinal tears in the literature. And what we, what we were, what I was fishing for, because everybody is on aspirin nowadays, I thought, excuse me, that if people were on anticoagulants, there was going to be a much lower risk of tear with vitreous hemorrhage than people not on anticoagulants, because they would bleed just from the PVD, whereas in a person not on anticoagulants actually had to tear the retina. We didn't quite found that, but we found pretty close. So we found it was almost about almost exactly 50% of people with a hemorrhagic PVD have a retinal tear. The old number used to be 70. I think it's moving toward 50. Um, if they have aspirin or they're taking blood thinners, it's lower, but it's still pretty high. It's almost 40%. And if they are not taking <coughs> medicines, it's a little over 50%. So that wasn't significant. 
Um, if you see an area, if you're examining somebody with a PVD and you see a peripheral retinal hemorrhage, you should know where that is and check it in a week or two because that could be an area that's going to turn into a tear. I don't know who got these pictures. They're great though. They shot the photo with just the hemorrhage and then they show like the tear and then they show the laser. I love those pictures. But, um, but if you see a hemorrhage in the periphery, and you'll see that a fair amount of the time, um, people with, who have a hemorrhagic PVD will subsequently get tears about 12% of the time. Most subsequent tears are within the first six months of the uh, symptoms. Um, okay, so high risk tears. So this is where I was looking at 2%. The tears that we're really looking for are the flap tears. So symptomatic flap tears, a little bit of fluid. If they're pseudophagic, if the other eye had a RD, those are high-risk tears. Low-risk tears are asymptomatic, atrophic, somebody's phagic, if there's pigment around or if there's a percolate. So you, you really don't need to treat little retinal holes in people with a PVD. You're probably seeing a hole that's been there practically since birth. If there's an opercolated tear with hemorrhage, I treat it, and I think most people do. You may not have to, though, it's because you, because there's no vitreoretinal retinal traction there. So it should be able to detach. There's an interesting thing. I don't know if you've watched retinal detachment surgery with your attendings, but there are some, when you make a drainage retinotomy, and posteriorly, there are some people who feel that doesn't need to be lasered. I think almost everybody lays. But there have been some small series, because there's no traction. So once the retina goes down, I think almost everybody lasers it. So um, treat laser, we've got to do cryo or laser or both. You guys, I don't have a, do you have an indirect laser? I don't have an indirect laser. Indirect lasers are great for treating tears. But if you have a, you can get around them with a the lens. Or if you have to do cryo anteriorly, you can do that. Um, so here's my practical advice for all this. Because I've got, um, if you don't get a laser taken, we had a, I think it was one of the people from the base. I think it was a resident that had graduated. It was a couple of years out, and they were treating a retinal tear, and they just couldn't get it to treat. And they called me, and I, and um, no, they sent the patient over without calling me. And the note was they just couldn't get the laser to take. And it was because there's fluid. So what you do is you, you, if you're lasering a tear, you just kind of march away from it until you get a take. Now, if you're way away from it, your power might be too low, or the cataract might be blocking, or the hemorrhage is in the way. You know, don't go down to the macula or anything. But you can give your, but there's often a little cuff of fluid, and you got to get outside of that. And sometimes, honestly, occasionally you look at say, you know, you got a big retinal detachment, we can't laser this. You know, you need to go get that fixed. Um, that's number one. If the tear is like at three or nine o'clock, do do something for anesthesia because they're going to be jumping out of the seat when you go over the ciliary nerve. If it's at, up top, you don't need to. You don't usually need anesthetic for a retinal tear treatment. Um, I always tell people, laser doesn't stick right away. It, see, people, it seems like it would, but it doesn't. And if you look at the science, it's actually less adhesive for a couple of days after laser because of the edema. So you got to tell them to take it easy for a week. I can tell you, I think in my memory, I have one person who detached even though I lasered it, and it was a giant tear. It wasn't a regular tear. But there's probably more because you tend to put stuff out of your head when there's complications. Um, it's the surgical thing. But um, So they have to take it easy for a week. The other thing is warn the patient laser does nothing for their flashes and floaters. Or they're gonna they're gonna come back later and say the laser didn't work. So you're lasering them for the tear, it does absolutely nothing. In fact, they'll probably get more flashes where you treated them right afterwards. And the the other thing you have to tell people is when you laser them for anything, that their vision's gonna be black for about five minutes after the laser, because people are scared of laser, and then they sit back and they're blind and they think oh my God, that was the worst decision in my life. I just got blinded in my eye. So I always tell people, if it's a diabetic laser or anything, when I laser them, that you're gonna have temporary vision loss, but it's only for, and you're better off saying it might be for the rest of the day. Because if you say it's for 10 minutes and if it goes 15 minutes. So, so I tell people it's gonna be bad for a while and for the rest of the day, don't worry about the eye. And then 10% um, of people who've developed retinal tear develop more tears. Most of them are the first six or eight weeks, but honestly, it goes out to a year. And I used to see people for three months or six months, but now everybody comes back for a year. So my, my algorithm is, um, you know, you treat them. You have to see them back in a week or two. And that's the nice thing about the week or two visit is because they don't have to worry about whether they're missing something. So they'll go, you know, say, I'm seeing you in a week. 
you know, if your floaters change, your, unless your vision goes, you know, don't worry about what you're seeing. And then, um, and then usually a week, then a month, and then usually two or three months, three months, four months, and then they're done. Um, and the big thing to tell them is 2% uh, have breaks. Uh, so, so, you know, 2% of PVDs have breaks, 50% with blood have breaks, 100% with pigment have breaks. And then this is sort of the counseling for posterior vitreous detachment, which is dense, but I'll put it up on your, I'll put my discussion up on the site so you guys can look at it. Because otherwise, you'll, the people will just call calling back and coming, and it's nice to have a good explanation. So first thing to say is it's normal. You know, posterior vitreous separation isn't a disease, it's completely normal. Because people are terrified and they think they have a retinal detachment. The other thing you should know, which it's funny, you'll hear people talk about, what do you say to your patients with floaters? And this whole conversation will save you a lot of time. You can't focus in your eyes, so what you perceive is shadows on your retina. You tell the patients that. So what I do is I hold my hand over the table and I'll say, like, this is your retina and this is the floater, and you see how there's a shadow there when my hand's close. And then when you move, the floater moves away from the retina, the light goes around it and you don't see it anymore. And people understand that, but in certain lighting, is that next thing? In certain lighting that's direct, you'll always see your floaters. So if you look at the sky or you look at the clouds or a computer screen sometimes, you'll see your floaters. That doesn't mean you have more. That just means you're seeing them better. I could do this in my sleep. And then, and so that's the lighting. And then the other, so what they need to know is when to come back. So half the time when the retina tears, a blood vessel breaks and you get blood in the eye, which gives hundreds of little pepper spots. So if they see hundreds of little pepper spots, that might mean there's a tear and they need to come back. I always say half the time because I'll tell them later. Sometimes if I'm being really thorough, I'll say it doesn't happen all the time. That's why you got to keep your second appointment. So you say half the time, but sometimes you don't get any symptoms. So you got to come back for your second check. Um, the floaters can persist forever. So it can be weeks, months, or years. People, if you say they can go for years, people get like, oh no, they're going to go for years. So I usually say they usually go away in a couple weeks or a couple months, but they, they might, might be there for a long time. And then flashes can persist for um, a year or two and they change with different activities, but most tears occur within the first weeks, so that's why you have to come back. And then I always tell people you can remove the floaters, but because of the risk, we almost never do that. We rarely do it. So that's your kind of whole floater discussion, and that'll save you a lot of time. What you don't want to say, which is what almost everybody says, is if there's a change call. You know, because they change all the time. You get up in the morning in different lighting they change, the flashes come and go. So, so what, and then as we're leaving, all I do is I say, hundreds of pepper spots come back in, otherwise I'll see you in six weeks. And then at the second visit, I say, almost everybody gets their tears within the first six weeks. It's extremely unlikely, but still if you get hundreds of pepper spots come back. And that's the whole discussion. So that's posterior vitreous saturation. So PVD is about 2%, but if you include, you know, you can say 20% if you're staying in compliance with your book. Um, retinal tears, hemorrhagic PVD is 50% of tears, and then pigments 100%. For hemorrhagic PVDs, you see them back in a week or two. For regular PVDs, I used to do two months, I tightened it up to six weeks. I think your book says a month, which I think is excessive. So any question about PVD? It's a lot of your practice is PVDs. So, all right, well, thanks for your attention. So we'll do 